A lot of news has been going around about NVIDIA's new and yet-to-be-released 50 series GPUs. Rumors abound concerning potential performance, with 5080 ranges in the 4090 performance profile. Given NVIDIA's lack of complacency compared to their competitors, I actually believe this to be plausible. What isn't clear, however, is what the prices of these new products will be. If the past is any indicator, the flagship will steadily rise with its closest derivative trickling behind. Fans might get outraged, but all NVIDIA has to do is rebrand their product and then, just like that, the PC plebs are appeased. Just like the 4080 12GB being rebranded as the 4070Ti. If NVIDIA does maintain the prices on these new GPUs rather than raising them, the PC value proposition will easily outmatch the consoles. Sony and Microsoft's latest consoles thus far have maintained their performance per dollar advantage over the PC, far longer than any other prior generation. Of course, this also assumes that the performance improvements will be maintained across the entire suite of GPU options, not just the high end. I made the prediction that gaming PC components would need another year, maybe two, to finally claim the superior value proposition over the consoles. If Nvidia delivers, and maintains the price without sabotaging their low-end products, my prediction will be false. While NVIDIA continues to solidify their grip on the high-end market, AMD essentially, at least according to analysts and commentators, has given up on competing with NVIDIA, at least at the high end. There's a much larger discussion to be had about whether or not they are admitting defeat or just making a tactical retreat. A brief analysis of their history shows that AMD has at numerous times been competitive with NVIDIA. Even when AMD has been the undisputed leader in performance and price, they have still lost market share to NVIDIA. By the way, this sort of tactical retreat is nothing new. AMD has done similar things in the past with the release of the first generation of RDNA, or the release of the Polaris GPU. And in between the releases of those GPUs, AMD has found ways to compete at the high end, eventually, again. The 6900 XT did an excellent job competing at conventional graphics performance, not so much with upscaling and ray tracing, but these two features had not yet caught on as the paradigm shift they are currently. Before RDNA 2, there was the Vega 64, which fell very, very short of expectations. Prior to that, the Fury X, and although not a knockout blow, or even a win, it was at the very least still a competitive product. The Hawaii GPU, also known as the Radeon R9 290X, was the last GPU AMD ever sold that altogether embarrassed NVIDIA in performance and price. It was primarily competing with the Titan, which was a GPU that sold for $1,000, and not only did the Hawaii GPU beat it in performance, it beat it in price. It was sold for $500 compared to NVIDIA's $1,000. Nevertheless, it didn't make a difference in AMD's fight for the almighty measure of GPU dominance known as GPU market share. No matter what AMD has done, NVIDIA has always outsold them. Consumers have never preferred AMD over NVIDIA, even when AMD was objectively better. So yes, it is sad that they are retreating from the high end today, but what are they supposed to do? When they win in performance, they lose. When they win in price, they lose. When they win in both, they lose. No matter what they do, they still lose. How does anyone beat an enemy like that? Some of you might remember the bulldozer and pile driver CPUs. They were an absolute disaster for AMD. AMD lost so much money on those systems that they were on the verge of bankruptcy. The only thing keeping AMD alive for a short while during all those years of losses and self-sabotage was their win in the console ecosystem. It sustained them till the release of Ryzen in 2017, their first competent CPU to be released in over six years. And while it still had flaws, it laid the foundation for a new strategy AMD would gradually build upon. As the Ryzen product line matured, AMD's CPU market share increased. It increased enough that they no longer needed to worry about competing with NVIDIA. Even if Radeon GPU components failed against NVIDIA's, the likelihood that a GeForce buyer would also buy a Ryzen CPU increased dramatically with each generation. From 2017 onward, AMD was in a position where victory for their rival, NVIDIA, was no longer a loss for themselves. And with the release of the ninth generation of consoles, AMD could finally lay the foundation for the construction of their secret weapon. 
But first, it's important to understand what happened in the past in order to understand where we are now. In 2018, NVIDIA rushed the release of its Turing GPUs, knowing they needed to be the first to market with a brand new rendering paradigm, real-time ray tracing. Knowing full well this feature by itself would not be enough, they fortified their efforts with a new component they had been testing in servers and with their new Volta GPU, the Tensor Core. Jensen Huang, realizing its potential for denoising and ray tracing applications, also foresaw the potential for real-time image reconstruction. An ingenious foresight, but for which the first attempt would be an abysmal failure. Yes, he rushed these features to market, but he had to. He knew AMD would be featuring its own version of real-time ray tracing in the release of the PlayStation 5 and Series X consoles. He also knew they would be competitive in price and performance. He needed to be the first to market in order to build Mindshare and saturate the market with products that already had these cutting-edge new features, one of which AMD would not anticipate. Even with CompTOL-optimized showings of ray tracing seemingly invalidating NVIDIA's work, NVIDIA could rest knowing third-party games when ported to the PC would be played on NVIDIA first. The second iteration of Tensor Core upscaling was finally ready too. So when AMD went for the attack in 2020 with the consoles, its Ryzen CPUs, and RDNA 2 GPUs, the 690 XT being its flagship, NVIDIA was able to anticipate masterfully and intuitively counter the blow. The genius and foresight of Jensen Wong cannot be understated. But even he realized this was not the end of the war. No, it was just beginning. He knew full well that AMD had not yet created their secret weapon. Not for the PC gaming market, at least. I've said this before, but the PlayStation 5 was comparable in performance to the RTX 2070 Super and RTX 2080. The Series X was comparable to the RTX 2080 Ti, at least in raster performance. Keep in mind that the PlayStation 5 and Series X were complete systems, APUs, SOCs, compared to graphics cards alone, some of which were being sold for double their price. The release of Ampere would close that gap considerably, but not comfortably. Lovelace would close that gap slightly more so, but not enough to properly beat the console value proposition. It was only a matter of time before powerful APUs like this would be released in laptops and especially desktops. Interestingly enough, the first PC APU to incorporate all of AMD's latest features was released by Valve, who would debut their version of Nintendo's Switch in the form of the Steam Deck. It was spectacular. And amazingly, a market NVIDIA had no presence in. Later iterations with bigger APUs would begin to appear in much more power-hungry alternatives to the Steam Deck and in laptops. And each new iteration was more capable than the last. It was only a matter of time before AMD would achieve parity in features regarding AI and ray tracing acceleration. This may be the reason why NVIDIA tried to buy ARM. Having complete control of the x86 alternative would have been very convenient for creating an alternative to AMD's complete system integration. Nevertheless, the attempt to buy ARM was shut down, because NVIDIA failed to demonstrate a compelling reason for needing to buy the company. Rather than use their pre-designed specs or design a new chip with their already held design license, AMD is currently on Strix Point. Unlike the Van Gogh chip in the Steam Deck, Strix Point has 8 cores, AI support, and an amazing edge in power consumption over all its competitors. Even competing with the ARM on Windows laptop released with Qualcomm's ARM SoC. Unlike the ARM on Windows laptop, AMD's APU has no compatibility issues or unsupported features. It's even faster than the low-end desktop graphics released by NVIDIA prior to the launch of the PlayStation 5. And rumors have circulated endlessly about the Big Brother equivalent to the Strix Point APU, Strix Halo, a massive 16-core behemoth with performance targets ranging from the Series S to the Series X levels of GPU graphics potential. Even if it falls short of expectations, it represents yet another paradigm shift in PC gaming and potentially the beginning of the end for NVIDIA. Much of NVIDIA's business in PC gaming has revolved around not just desktop discrete GPUs, but also laptops. The cost savings and power savings combined would absolutely destroy everything except the high-end offerings from NVIDIA. Many other commentators have said this as well, but the arrival of Strix Halo could bring about the end of low-end graphics cards. 
It's important to remember that the GTX 1060 is still the most popular GPU on the Steam hardware survey. Many of those gamers will be looking to upgrade their computers very soon. If low and mid-range graphics cards find their value threatened by integrated graphics, especially if these integrated solutions are unbeatable in price, this simplification of system design will doubtless appeal to that market. The next logical question is this. If AMD had the potential to do this for the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series consoles, why didn't they just release counterparts for the PC alongside them the same year? Why wait till now? The first answer to that question is the grinding to a halt of Moore's Law. Building larger and larger components in the form of monolithic system-on-chip designs is incredibly expensive. Too expensive to sell as a standalone product. In the DIY PC configuration. At least, competitively. Rumors have suggested that Strix Halo will be a chiplet design. And while AMD had released chiplet APU designs in the server market, it wasn't yet clear that they could achieve the symbiosis necessary to run real-time graphics applications at the quality they needed. This is one of the reasons the Radeon RX 7900 XTX were comprised of one GPU and many I.O. chiplets, rather than two GPUs put together. Although, the day in which this feat becomes possible is fast approaching, shortly following the CPU-GPU integration promised by Strix Halo. With that realization, it becomes perfectly clear what the secret weapon is that AMD possesses. It's not just an APU. It's the gradual iteration as AMD combines its ever-growing collection of accelerator technologies, acting as a war of attrition against its rivals. It's only a matter of time before everything but the high end surrenders itself to the system-on-chip and system-on-socket designs. Theoretically, Intel could do this too, even with their immense struggle to enter into the GPU market. The reason why NVIDIA can't do this too is because most servers run in x86-powered computer environments. NVIDIA has tried in the past to acquire a design license for x86, but failed. And although they designed their own ARM solutions, the server and desktop support for ARM remains limited at best. However, that may change in the next five years. It is important to remember that no matter what challenges have faced NVIDIA, Jensen Wong has always anticipated and maneuvered effectively to maintain his company's dominance. It has been true for many years now that NVIDIA is no longer just a gaming company, but an enterprise cloud workstation and server company. And although AMD is waging a war of attrition in these markets too, NVIDIA is the company with the God Emperor CEO, using not just his deep understanding of how computers work, but also his salesmanship, business instincts, charisma, branding, marketing, and understanding of psychology to chart a clear course towards the unclear future. His foresight and ability to plan for contingencies is unparalleled. NVIDIA will no doubt remain the company introducing new software features to the GPU for the foreseeable future. And the more ARM support improves, the less NVIDIA needs to worry about its weaknesses regarding x86 CPU designs. A convergence of sorts is setting itself in motion where AMD and NVIDIA wait each other out, one new invention at a time. With that understanding, there is only one series of questions left to ask. How vulnerable could NVIDIA possibly be when they have a mastermind leader divining constant innovation while also possessing the ability to outspend and outproduce AMD. Do the words of their founder, Jeremiah Sanders III, still ring true? Can AMD still out-innovate its competitors? Thank you so much to those of you who have decided to watch this video. If any of you would like to support me, please consider subscribing to my channel or liking my video. If you did not like my video, please feel free to say so in the comments. The comments section is always fun. Regardless, I hope all of you have a good day, and I hope I at least gave you something to think about.